since the days of Jawaharlal Nehru, one would regard the action plan of 1988 as the culmination of the endeavor in this regard, rather than something that uh, emerged sort of full-blown from Rajiv Gandhi's head in 1988. And I think Rajivji himself would have been the first to acknowledge this. Indeed, he did so acknowledge it in the speech that he made at the United Nations while presenting this action plan. Relentless crusade that he had against apartheid and the freeing of Nelson Mandela as a personal cause. Uh, could you elaborate a little in terms of anecdotes or what was Rajiv's real sort of uh, philosophy? Uh, I think this? Rajivji, very much like his grandfather Jawaharlal Nehru, was a man of the world rather than only a man of India. And because he knew the world and he knew the prejudices that afflict the world, he was also very deeply conscious of the contribution which the Indian ethic could make to the resolution of these uh, world problems, including the problem of prejudice one against another. Prejudice, he saw, arises from narrow exclusivisms in definitions of one's own identity. And it is when a people say to themselves that we are what we are because we are not something else, that prejudice then becomes discrimination and discrimination becomes oppression. And the highest form of oppression of this nature in our contemporary world was apartheid, which simply decreed that the color of a man determined his superiority or his inferiority, his place in society and his future prospects, not only for his own time, but for all time. And it was in this light that he felt that apartheid was the expression of an atavistic uh, belief, an atavistic superstition that must be eliminated if the world was to move to its next higher level of civilization. And that to do this, India had a particularly important role to play because in a civilizational sense, India had refused to accept race or religion or culture or language or clothes or food as a basis for defining nationhood. And we were a living example of the repudiation of any form of apartheid over a period of so many thousands of years that we could demonstrate that a stable society was possible on a basis other than the basis on which apartheid was sought to be propagated or defended. And therefore, he saw, I think, this struggle against apartheid as integral to the larger cause of taking the message of India to the world. And that is what perhaps infused his approach to this issue with such sincerity and such passion. And this sincerity came through so transparently that after he had ceased to be Prime Minister, uh, President Simon Joma of uh, Namibia invited him to the official Independence Day celebrations. And long after he had ceased to exist, President Nelson Mandela invited his widow Sonia Gandhi to represent that cause, that passion, at the uh, celebrations to mark the end of apartheid in South Africa recently. You know, Rajiv's uh, relationship with Benazir was of, of a special kind. I mean, though there was this Indo-Pakistan -Pa antagonism, but still there was an effort to craft an innovative uh, relationship. Could you elaborate a little on, on this aspect of his foreign policy? Yes, I think he spotted that the thing which set him and Benazir Bhutto apart from all the others who had preceded them at the level of head of government in India and Pakistan was that both of them belonged to the post-partition generation. Everyone who had preceded them, whether in India or Pakistan, were grown people at the time that partition took place and therefore the scars of partition were very evident upon their psyche. He hoped that this post-partition generation would be able to resolve problems between the two countries which the pre-partition generation had evidently failed to resolve. Um, he recognized that this would be a long process and he recognized also that Benazir Bhutto's first government was a government that was very, very much trammeled by the military presence that was over, overweening and overlooming. Had in fact he become Prime Minister of India again and now been in this era where Benazir Bhutto is again the head of government, I am sure that some of the uh, perceptions that informed First, his letter of felicitations to Benazir on her election as Prime Minister and subsequently the banquet speech that he made in Islamabad on the first uh, ever visit by an Indian Prime Minister to Pakistan since the 1965 war 
would have informed the policies that India would have pursued at this time vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan. I must, however, add that he had a hard-headed appreciation of the real difficulties that stand in the way of a successful Indo-Pak dialogue. But I think it was his view that we should not allow ourselves to be overwhelmed by those odds, but despite those odds, persist in trying to find a viable, meaningful relationship between the two countries. You know, in the 1991 elections, when they were called and the campaigning was going on, there was a perception that he was on a comeback trail. Would you agree with that assessment? And what was the reason why people thought that he was on a comeback trail? I think the figures show that had Rajivji not been assassinated in the middle of the election, the Congress party would not have won a majority. In fact, it did not even win a majority despite his assassination. And uh, in a situation where the Congress was in a minority, there is no telling whether the opposition parties would have permitted Rajiv Gandhi to form a stable government. And also it is, I think, not known whether Rajiv Gandhi would have been ready to form a government in a situation that was inherently unstable. So I would imagine that the balance of probabilities is that had he actually survived the election process, he would not have been the no, Prime I'm not talking about him having survived it. I was, I'm talking about the psychological feel that was there when the campaign was on, or even when, when Chandrasekhar's government fell. You know, at that stage, there was a feel that Rajiv Gandhi was on a comeback trail. I think within the Congress, the sense that Rajiv Gandhi was in a comeback trail started on the 27th of November 1989. That was the day when I, in fact, wrote my first article when I said it is impossible that the conjuries of opposition parties will be able to form a stable government. And even by the end of a month after that, on the 31st of December 1989, I had written an article in the Telegraph which said, rise, fall, rise. It was evident to me as I think it was to a very large number of my colleagues in the Congress party, that Rajiv Gandhi's comeback was inevitable. It was merely a question of time, whether the comeback would take place in five years or three years, one year or a matter of weeks. And uh, consequently, the sense of his being on a comeback trail certainly infused the election process. And it was not until after that electoral process was over that we could make statistical assessments of probabilities of the kind that I had made just now. You know, during that period as an opposition leader, he, he came out with a great commitment to secularism because it was the period of LK Advani's Rath Yatra and of course Mandal and both of them had fractured the nation, so to speak. Uh, could you speak a little about his commitment to secularism? You know, the Sadbhavana Yatras that you, he undertook as an opposition leader? I think uh, it would be misconceived, uh, deeply misconceived, to think of Rajiv Gandhi's commitment to secularism or propagation of secularism as something that characterized his period in opposition. It was very evident from almost the day, in fact from the day that he assumed the Prime Ministership of India on the 31st of October 1984 and was faced with this orgy of communal violence between the Hindus and the Sikhs for a day or two immediately after the assassination of Indira Gandhi. And it was in that phase, perhaps in his very first speech, perhaps the second or third, that he used an expression which was to become, if you like, the light motive of his prime ministership and indeed of his years in the opposition, which was the words, secularism is the bedrock of our nationhood. He just could not conceive of India surviving a communal holocaust. He just could not conceive of India as surviving on the basis of a communal definition. And therefore, he struggled against com communalism right through his political life. This struggle became especially acute after the Ram Janma Bhumi issue started surfacing towards the end of 1988. And I think the very best speech, the most detailed speech on the subject of secularism that he made in his life was a speech on the subject to parliament in May 1989 when he was very much the Prime Minister of India. Uh, what perhaps brought the matter into higher profile was that it was communalism that, had prim that was primarily responsible for his electoral defeat of 1989. And in the period between December 1989 and November 1990, when the VP Singh government fell, it was clear that these forces of communalism riding on the backs of blind anti-Congressism had succeeded in mounting a challenge to the secular polity of India of a nature that had not been seen since the partition of India in 
1947. And therefore, his own opposition to secularism had to become not merely one of thought, or, uh, but thought, but also one of deed. And it is in that, that the, it is in that context, in that perspective, that the Sadbhavana Yatras, which he started in September, October 1990, should be uh, viewed. What, in your opinion, having worked so closely with him, was the, was the vision of Rajiv Gandhi? And what was the legacy that you think, political and social legacy, that he left behind? I think he summed up that vision more than once in a phrase that was very carefully crafted in more than one of his speeches. He talked of restoring India in the coming 21st century to its traditional position in the vanguard of human civilization. I ask you to look at each of these words very carefully. He did not suggest for a moment that he had to take India to that position. It is a matter of restoring India to that position because when he looked back at the history of India, he saw that out of the last 5,000 years, India has been in the vanguard for 4,800.